So welcome everyone. My name is Trevor Griffey. I am a co-founder and once was project coordinator for the Seattle Civil Rights and Labor History Project at the University of Washington. And actually a little known story, despite our website at www.civilrights.washington.edu uh, being fairly prominent, what's less known is some of the history of our own uh, project, which actually comes out of um, my doing, uh, my being allowed to sit in on an oral history conducted about 14 years ago by uh, workers in Seattle who had developed a series of community-based kind of struggles to both desegregate the construction trades, to desegregate the, the Alaska canneries, and then also to expand a vision of what was possible for labor both here in Seattle and around the world. And so in the spirit of the Labor and Working Class History Association's uh, previous conferences, the very first one I attended was in 2005 in, at UC Santa Barbara. And I personally was totally inspired and even a little transformed by the experience of going to an academic conference where instead of it being academics sitting on stage and talking about working people or whomever their subjects were, um, Professor Michael Honey from UW Tacoma sat up alongside Reverend James Lawson and talked about the sanitation worker strike. Ruth Needleman sat up alongside three or four pioneering uh, steel workers from, uh, who were all women who had entered the trades in the 1970s. Um, and seeing this interchange of historical authority, one in which it's not just historians who claim that their tenure track positions or their appointments or their books give them authority, but working with uh, other activists and scholars and, uh, and people in the community to share not just knowledge but authority uh, was really profound. And so when LACHA came here in 2017 to the University of Washington, I wanted to give back to the labor history community and introduce you to part of Seattle's living kind of labor radicalism. Seattle's in the headlines a lot these days for it being a pioneer in the $15 minimum wage, for it being a pioneer in um, uh, fighting back against wage theft, uh, for it generally having kind of a, a being to the left of center for the most part. Uh, and some of you will be going on a labor history book tour, uh, not book tour, a labor tour. history bus tour uh, in the near future as part of your examining uh, the history and practices of kind of activism in this area but I thought there would be no way to kind of understand uh, contemporary labor politics without also incorporating the history of the United Construction Workers, the Alaska Cannery Workers Association, and the Labor and Employment Law Office, which later became the Legacy of Equality and Leadership organizing. Organ uh, or and Organizing, uh, but LELO for short, um, L-E-L-O and to introduce you to some of those scholar activists. And so we have here today Harley Bird to talk about the United Construction Workers Association and the struggle to desegregate the building trades in Seattle in the late 60s and 1970s uh, that is unfortunately still ongoing. Uh, we have Michael Wu to talk about how black construction workers in this struggle reached out to and developed solidarity with Filipino cannery workers who then took the black worker organizing model into a different industry using Title VII litigation to do dynamic organizing that had a transnational impact and developed a kind of radical third world politics that was also located in labor activism here in Seattle. Uh, Ricardo Otego will talk about the International Worker to Worker Project that Lilo later developed as part of this ongoing community-based labor formation that is really distinct to Seattle and remarkable. Cindy Domingo will talk about uh, the women's delegation to Cuba. Is that the right way to, to call it? Okay, I wasn't totally sure. And then uh, Gary Owens as part of our kind of um, talking about how we would introduce Seattle uh, or conference goers to some of these topics. We thought, you know, we don't wanna just kind of leave some of these civil rights struggles around the construction trades and urban redevelopment to the past. We wanna remind folks that these are still ongoing struggles that Lilo and other workers are still involved in that this is not just a, a legacy question, this is an ongoing sort of struggle and we want to bring people up to speed on challenges for public transit and public housing in particular as sites of contestation in which not only labor unions fighting for PLAs, but community groups saying we need to get more women and people of color into the trades. And so that's our ambitious outline. And uh, much of the kind of conversation, what we hope to do is to provide a space for each of the panelists to kind of cover some of these topics 
and then turn it over to a conversation in which we welcome a back and forth about any number of these questions, whether historiographical, related to labor unions, or even just broader kind of contemporary activism. <coughs> um, but before we get started with that, the folks asked me to kind of provide an introduction to some of these organizations uh, that would just provide a little bit of a framework so you have a better <laughs> sense of their uh, testimony on the different kinds of projects that they were doing. And so um, it's hard to talk about any of this work without talking about the, the legacy and importance of Tyree Scott in Seattle's labor community and in Seattle's community more generally. Uh, Tyree Scott right here at the bottom of this slide is holding a sign, with, there's his wife Bev, uh, saying, organize the unorganized, no separate peace. No separate peace is a slogan that came out of Tyree's uh, activism and organizing in the early 1970s to identify a way in which we could think about the struggles to desegregate certain industries as part of a bigger labor movement. That instead of seeing it as civil rights over here and labor rights over the other, where unions and civil rights activists are in conflict, that actually we need to see that any labor movement has to be engaged in not a separate piece just for their workers, but really imagine themselves as being for all workers. And this is important because Tyree himself, um, after serving uh, for approximately eight years in the Marine Corps, doing a tour of duty in Vietnam, moved to Seattle where his father was an electrical contractor uh, worked in Seattle's African-American community and was a, a co-founder of the Central Contractors Association, a black contractors association that tried to get access to bids uh, for government redevelopment projects, but also tried to get jobs for black workers who were systematically excluded from the higher rungs of the building trades unions across the country. So um, building trades unions would sometimes throw out statistics and they'd say something like 7% of our membership is black. Um, what they wouldn't say is, and they're all laborers, or maybe some carpenters, maybe, maybe some bricklayers, but none of them are plumbers. None of them are uh, sheet metal workers. None of them are electricians, and all those folks make more money. And this is a systematic practice. And so Tyree, as part of forming the Central Contractors Association, was beginning a push in the late 1960s to push against this segregation in the trades. And early on, as the CCA started, it initially was going to sue uh, local governments for not complying with civil rights law. Civil rights law had been on the books for decades in the United States, then amplified by new executive orders in the early to mid 1960s at the state and federal level that said federal contractors should not discriminate on the basis of race. That was the law, but it was never enforced. Uh, the law, they would say, well, we'll put this language in, but if unions discriminate on the basis of race on these contracts, that's a collective bargaining issue. That's not actually a contracting issue. It was sort of segregated out such that labor and race were split off. And so at first, the central contractors approached uh, this issue by saying we're going to bid when we can't get bids because of the way that the industry is structured, we're going to sue. But the same day that this article came out in the Seattle Times, it turns out, Harley, I don't think you tipped them off so well, because this was, this was the same day that folks from the Central Contractors Association went to a pool that was under construction in Seattle's black neighborhood, named after Medgar Evers, Medgar Evers Pool, and said, you will not work here if there are not African Americans working on the job. We've now reached a point at which we are no longer okay with not enforcing the law. And so early kind of protests where you would see this African American contractors leading the way, both is, is this kind of hybrid of employers and workers going to construction sites saying you don't work if we don't work, you are violating federal law. So when we look at this sign from an early protest where they're marching downtown, here's Tyree Scott, a younger image of him, it says King County and the King County Labor Council both must obey, and then you see in big sort of, it's circled there behind the person's head, obey the law. So instead of saying protesters are violating the law, they're saying unions are violating the law, employers are violating the law, the government's violating its own law, and this is ridiculous, and it needs to stop now. And so you saw protests taking place both in Seattle's African-American neighborhood, the Central District, and you saw them taking place 
uh, and growing much quicker. It's going from 12 people to 200 people almost overnight uh, moving downtown and picketing at various federal government construction sites at the height of federal government spending in America. This was part of a bigger movement. Seattle didn't invent the construction site closure, but throughout sum the summer and fall of 1969, uh, starting especially in Pittsburgh and also in Chicago, but then spreading in, in starting there in July and August and then spreading in September to other cities, Seattle's protest, and here you see Tyree being arrested, um, was part of other struggles where this issue was taking center stage and would later, as Tom Segrew has documented in his own history, um, serve as one of the foundation flashpoints for the invention of affirmative action policy. First targeted to break down the racist barriers in the construction industry, later used as a model for other employer situations at the, at the public level and later private. But so Seattle's actions were part of a protest wave. Now what happened following that protest wave? Well, this is a lot of text. But this is, this is the sequence of events that more or less happened in almost every city in the country, except Seattle and a few others. First, the Department of Labor would come in because they've instigated a kind of new enforcement system for civil rights law. And they'd say, um, you need to work this out. So instead of collective bargaining between workers in a union and employers, they would say, you also need representatives of the black community. You need tripartite negotiations. Unions hated this. They thought that, that um, the black community was being used as, come on in, that the black community was being used as a, um, as a kind of tool by employers to break unions. They did not think that their racism in excluding workers from the labor movement had produced a situation in which black workers had independent interests from both employers and unions. So they, the very idea that they would have to bargain with workers that they excluded was anathema to them. But most of them did it because the, the possibility of losing federal contracts was so big. And then who gets to represent the black community? Often it's not the black contractors themselves that led the struggle. In many other cities, it's usually the Urban League. It was well positioned politically. It was often funded by corporations. It was a civil rights proponent, but usually not a proponent of direct action, depending on the city. And so a representative from the Urban League would, would claim to stand in for the whole of the black community in these negotiations. They often didn't have experience with collective bargaining, and they might get played in the bargaining process. What would emerge out of this was an affirmative action plan called a hometown plan that had a few kind of statistics that would say, we're going to bring X number of people into the trades. Uh, but it would have very little enforcement mechanism, and it would be one time only. So in this case, the unions would say, all right, we'll dispatch out a certain number of black workers who are skilled, and we'll, and we'll incorporate a certain number of uh, black apprentices into our union apprenticeship programs. But how they then handle it is they would basically be horrible people to, and, and openly racist to the people that were then brought on the job sites. Those people would quit and not be replaced or they might be replaced enough that you would be in paper compliance with the law, but nobody would be learning a trade, nobody would get, be getting meaningful work. And then at a certain point, because of the way the plans were written, they'd say, well, we appointed our certain number of African Americans to the job, and now the hometown plan is done. And after this would happen, it was pretty dispiriting in many communities. And it was something that left people feeling kind of bitter and sort of like, wow, that was actually worse than the system before because it was a horrible experience for the people who were put into it and it didn't really do much to break down the racism in the industry and it seems to have even emboldened them where they were punishing people in vulnerable positions, right? And then meanwhile, black contractors were to some degree by federal policy split off from black workers. Black contractors got set aside programs but often not with requirements that in addition to getting that set aside, they had to have a certain percentage of black workers on the job. Now, it may be dependent on the contract, but what that meant is that in some cases, black workers who had operated as small contractors would have an incentive to join a large firm that already existed and then have a largely white workforce working under them. So now the federal government's law is actually splitting black workers and black contractors' interests from each other, and black workers are really being screwed by this desegregation process. 
Okay, so that's the horrible story of attempts to desegregate most of the construction industry across the country in the U.S. But Seattle's different, and why is that? Seattle's different because its union leadership never would even bargain or recognize the Urban League, basically. That's one of the big reasons, is that it, saw, it thought we are a very powerful union, this is union busting, and we have no interest in, in even pretending to negotiate. We're not gonna negotiate a deal that's good for us, we're just gonna let this go, and we're gonna resist it totally. Well, that means the tripartite negotiations that the Department of Labor would try to bring in failed immediately. And instead, what you see are massive protests like this, where an ad hoc group organized by the building trades that called itself Voice, Voice of Irate Construction Employees, so mobilizing a kind of whiteness and rage, uh, marched on, in the thousands, both on the King County Executive and also on the, on the state government. And so this is a march from Capitol. Uh, on the Capitol building in, in Olympia, Washington. And you can see from their slogans a kind of discourse of this is reverse discrimination uh, that, that echoes to this day and sort of has, has echoes of the emergence of the new right during this moment. So it says, some of this is a little bit hazy in here, but so it says civil rights for who? The idea that union members' civil rights are being violated. Uh, reliable men finish high school. The idea being that if you need affirmative action, you must be unreliable in any way you're uneducated. Again, eliding the racism in the industry. We build, not burn, just, which is to say some of the unions are saying this is a, an extortion attempt to try to break in because they're engaging in protests, but we are actually good citizens. This one I never saw until I was preparing for this presentation. It says, what next with a question mark, and it seems to have a gun and a bat in it. And I don't know what that means exactly, but we can perhaps discuss that afterwards. But it seemed to suggest that tempers were boiling over. Uh, it did not recognize uh, the legitimacy of any claims the black workers were making. And it basically said, you know, tough. This is, this is our, these are our rights as workers, okay? In response to that, we see a growing militancy in the black contractor movement here in Seattle. And so at the request of some of our panelists, if I'm not taking too much time, uh, they asked that we show, a, a, we got TV news footage from National TV News of Brinkley showing some of the Seattle protests taking place uh, here on the University of Washington campus. So Red Square, where you see all those bricks, um, named partly because of the red bricks and partly because the new left was prominent, they thought it would be ironic to call it Red Square. Um, underneath that is a large parking garage, and that parking garage was under construction, and you can see that when black workers showed up to shut things down and the workers resisted, they said, well, why don't we throw a few trucks in that, in that space that you're building, where you're building the parking lot, and maybe you'll get the message that we're serious business. The day later, they actually marched out onto the flight apron of SeaTac Airport and shut down construction at dozens of sites around the Port of Seattle and trying to expand the airport. Uh, creating a, a pretty tense situation briefly, but successfully shutting things down, making national news, bringing in the governor and saying, we are not going to be intimidated by these union protests. So let me now show you a news clip that provides you a little bit of the touch and feel of this moment. If I did it correctly, you'll also have sound. Today, the federal government put in effect what is called the Philadelphia Plan, an order to contractors doing federal building to hire a fixed percentage of minority group employees, which is to say Negroes. Unions and contractors object. They say it is illegal. They say it is just as illegal to hire anyone because of his race as it is to refuse to hire him because of his race. They also object that a quota for a minority group can also become a quota against them, an excuse for hiring only so many and then refusing to hire any more. But the order from the Labor Department is now in effect and perhaps it'll be settled in the courts. The Assistant Secretary of Labor, Arthur Fletcher, had a news conference about it. As far as I'm concerned, the unemployment of non-whites is not a social problem. When you don't have any money in your pocket, that's not a social problem. That's an economic problem. 
Uh, we have recognized that when farmers and other people in this society were having economic problems, we did things that were clothed in the economic movement to get change. For example, we came up with special legislation. When we realized that the farmers were not making an economic comeback, we did special things to aim federal money into the farm market. And one thing we told the farmer is keep working, keep producing your crop, and we'll buy that crop if necessary and store it somewhere and disperse, disperse it to India and various other places. But we're going to keep you working. This was in recognition that the farmers had an economic problem when they weren't making money, not a social problem. Okay, the same is true with non-whites. They have an economic problem when they're not making money. The Philadelphia plan is, is an economic effort to see to it that when we expend federal money, that we also channel some of that money into, the, into depressed neighborhoods, non-white neighborhoods. We have two ways of getting money in there. One is through welfare, and one is through employment. The Nixon administration is committed to employment. The AFL-CIO building trades unions meeting in Atlantic City heard their union leaders denounce the whole idea. They said, quote, we cannot accept the simplistic idea that the arithmetic of a population ratio shall be the standard for employment in the building trade. The last figure we have shows non-white workmen have about 7.5% of the union construction jobs, while the black population of the country is about 10 to 12%. Under Secretary of Housing Richard Van Dusen told the unions today that was not enough. At the University of Washington this morning, about 170 people who want more minorities on construction jobs tried to close a university building project, which they said did not hire enough black workmen. We're here for one thing, and that was what we come out for, and that was to get consideration and close the project down. One group leader said that since the contractors did not respect equal employment laws, the demonstrators need not respect the contractor's property. With that, the crowd began moving, but a white pump operator who didn't suffered a broken nose. The crowd then turned on the equipment and, according to Seattle police, did about $5,000 damage. They pushed two service trucks loaded with tools down the hill. Then they dumped a bulldozer on top. Seattle police grouped off campus 30 minutes after they were called. Two dozen patrolmen entered the area. By then, the damage had been done. The company had closed the project for the day, but the crowd remained angry. Between 60 and 70 policemen were eventually called in. 11 demonstrators were arrested. Today's closure was the fifth in two weeks. At four other sites, union personnel walked off the job rather than work with black trainees. This is Bob Fall reporting. So lots to potentially talk about there and in some of the presentations people will make. And we'll do kind of Q&A at the end. But um, worth noting, um, at the very end, it sort of sneaks it in that on four different sites, when black apprentices were dispatched, uh, white workers just walked off the job. They said, this is violating our contract. You're violating our rights. I'm not even going to work. And then when they showed up to all white work sites that weren't accepting black workers, um, then the, the struggle was, was uh, kind of the other way, where protesters were shutting things down. The cops were useless and came in after the fact because they had lost control and beat up the protesters. And Harley can even talk about that a little bit if, they, if he wants. Um, and so where did things go from there? At this point, the Department of Justice intervenes. Because whereas up until this point, there were attempts to work through the Department of Labor, there were attempts to do other things, there was this sense, even by the liberal Republican governor of the state, that this would continue to escalate unless there were some intervention. And there was a general agreement among um, a lot of Republicans who frankly didn't have the union side anyway but who also felt that there were legitimate grievances that African-American workers had that needed to be addressed. Um, and the Department of Justice, now having new power under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, sued four unions, actually five, but one settled, <coughs> to its credit, uh, in, the, in Seattle's building trades. And so instead of an attempt at desegregation that goes through a, a negotiated hometown plan, 
Instead, the unions refuse to settle and the, co the federal courts uh, expedite the process out of fear of public safety and find uh, that the unions had practiced systematic racial discrimination in their apprenticeship programs and in their hiring halls. And so they imposed a court-ordered desegregation plan that set numerical timetables and goals for the unions. And out of this then emerged a split where instead of black contractors leading the way, Tyree Scott with the funding of the American Friends Service Committee uh, and the support from Harley Bird and others who came out of this struggle formed what they called the United Construction Workers Association. And at this point, a group of black workers was organized as part of the class action. They started with the people who had, whose claims of racial discrimination had been part of the lawsuit that the Justice Department sued. And instead of treating them as individuals, said, we're going to organize them as an affected class. We're going to organize the workers brought in to the new apprenticeship program and on pre-apprentice. And we are going to be basically a union for people who are going through this affirmative action process. We are going to monitor the affirmative action plan that the judge has laid out. And we're going to recommend changes if the judge, if, if the system doesn't work. And you see this really remarkable kind of parallel structure that I would argue is similar to labor unions. But instead of using collective bargaining law, they're using affirmative action law to say this is a labor law violation. And when there's a violation, instead of workers getting into fisticuffs, an African-American worker would tell the workers back at the UCWA. They would have a discussion about how to handle it. And then sometimes somebody like Tyree would go out to a work site and talk to the foreman and say, look, you're not giving this person meaningful work, or you're not kind of going through proper process. It's laid out in the law. But then you have these advocates so that instead of the isolated individual, what Nancy McLean called in, in her book the lonesomeness of pioneering in terms of entering hostile workplaces, you actually have a powerful group of people who are uh, standing up for you. Out of this kind of connection between Title VII law and worker organizing, the UCWA inspired kind of other forms of organizing. I warned you that I was going to show photos of, of your younger selves. Um, and so uh, out of a kind of historic coalition that goes back at least to the 1930s and possibly before in Seattle, the black construction worker struggle inspired other communities of color in Seattle, both in its radicalism, but also in their, their turn to labor. This was very different than other parts of the black power movement that were connected to, for instance, the Black Panthers. And so um, Michael Wu, who will talk to us more about this and is pictured here, uh, was, par was part of the staff of the UCWA and later was part of its reaching out to Filipino cannery workers um, and saying this model we developed for litigation and then worker organizing could be a model for addressing systematic racial discrimination in the canneries. And so um, Silme and Nemesio Domingo take a lead in filing some of these early lawsuits using some of the same lawyers that the United Construction Workers had. And then you start seeing Filipino and black workers protesting for jobs for all at a variety of different kinds of economic uh, justice activist moments in Seattle, including you know, great boycotts and other things where you start to see this very labor-centered third world activism taking place. And, and, and the UCWA is really part of the heart of that. And out of this comes a complicated structure that is different on paper than in practice, but where the United Construction Workers get very ambitious. They imagine that this structure can be spread around the country. They get a large grant from the EEOC to uh, inform black workers about their rights in four states, including Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas. And they create what they call a Southwest Workers Federation. And they go to these different places and they organize people to file discrimination lawsuits and then organize an affected class of people into black worker organizations, developing a militancy and class politics in areas where often middle class leadership had previously dominated. But then it was part of this broader analysis where the United Construction Workers imagined itself connected to Oakland to Filipino cannery workers in Seattle, to black workers in Portland. Some of these organizing projects were more successful than others, but what you see is this rapid expansion and this headiness, this sense of Title VII provides us with this amazing organizing opportunity. 
And so, um, so out of this, they form a law office. And this is where I'm you know, digging up some crazy photos again. Uh, and they call it the Labor and Employment Law Office. And the idea is that workers need their own lawyers, that those lawyers need to represent um, uh, their working class, and that if you had a law office with a board of, cannery, of Filipino cannery workers, Mexican farm workers, and black construction workers, that this board could uh, uh, ensure that lawyers are not engaging in a process of sort of enriching themselves at workers' expense and that they then have lawyers on hand to file discrimination lawsuits that are more about developing a movement, that are more, that's more about organizing workers. And so here you see Michael Fox. Uh, they, this is kind of a clowning picture as far as I can tell because it says, send me your minorities up above. But with Michael Fox as an early attorney for this, Bev Sims, um, who later married Tyree Scott, an early secretary for the project. This was a picture I could get of the, the office. Um, and it's showing a little bit how law and legal organizing became a basis of this mobilization. Starting in the 1980s and after, you see that the kind of labor activism of the construction workers, the cannery workers, and other projects kind of all gets folded into LILO, and you could call it a community-based labor organization, somewhat similar to the worker centers you see in other cities, and here they are kind of protesting for um, good jobs at the, at the Port of Seattle in the late 1990s. But unlike other community-based labor organizations, it's not necessarily just local or nationalist in its framing. And another tendency within LILO then uh, comes from the mid to late 1970s when a number of its leaders, uh, uh, Michael, you went with Tyree to China, right? So here's a picture of Ty uh, Tyree at the Great Wall. Um, uh, Bev Sims went to Cuba. <coughs> Michael Sims went to um, India. Uh, Todd Hawkins, construction worker coming out of Seattle, went to Mozambique, I believe, before Tyree did. And as part of this international travel, they started rethinking some of the challenges of employment desegregation in a much more internationalist way. And so you see this internationalist analysis of workers and workers of color around the world needing to organize and develop their own power rather than deferring to elites to kind of oversee whether it's anything from desegregation to collective bargaining. Um, that is my probably too long-winded overview, but that's my attempt to say that there is a wide breadth of activity. There are lots of different projects that emerge out of these, and we are very, very fortunate to have activists from LILO to come kind of talk to us more about the variety of, of organizing projects and campaigns that they've been involved in and how they've uh, influenced both Seat local Seattle labor activism, but also uh, labor activism at, at many bigger scales as well. So with that, I want to kind of end my presentation and bring up the, our uh, esteemed guests as panelists so that they can talk about different parts of the legacy that I've described. And then we can do a Q&A after that. Does that sound good? And if somebody could get the lights, that would be great. Well, uh, as you probably already know, my name is Harley Bird. Um, I met Tyree Scotton in 1969. Uh, I was introduced to him by the esteemed black attorney called Limhard Howe. And I met him at his dad's um, electrical contractor office on 23rd, 23rd and Union. That, that. And we went, had, had, a, had a long talk and he wanted me to um, be the manager for the business manager for the Central Contractors Association. And that's how it all began. I mean, we, we sat and talked for about two and a half hours that first day. And at that, at that day, he gave me a book um, by Paul called Think and Grow Rich. And I read that book over and over again. It was the whole basis of positive thought. And that was his, his philosophy, the power of positive thought. Moving forward, um, the Central Contractors Association basically evolved into United Construction Workers Association because we found that 
that getting, getting contracts for, for black and minority contractors were not going to you know, solve the unemployment crisis that we, we had going on at the time. Uh, just to give you an example of that, we did a survey, a door-to-door -door survey, uh, of which, believe it or not, we got the county uh, through some federal program to pay, you know, the surveyors. So we hired a bunch of unemployed black and other minorities, you know, to go door-to-door -door and, and, and find out what the real unemployment rate was. And it turned out to be over 40% you know, in the central area. We went, knocked on every door, okay? And we documented this. And it was the basis, really, you know, you know for a lot of emphasis that, that, that we used in court, you know, to show the disparity in employment opportunities, you know, for blacks and other minorities. Um, <laughs> Trevor wrote down, how did you, recruit black workers, it wasn't hard at all. <laughs> I mean, they was, you know, everybody was crying for a job. <clears throat> demonstrations, when we would have demonstrations, I mean, we, it would start out, you know, maybe 50, 60, pretty soon it grew to two to 3,000. Um, and on Capitol Hill, uh, uh, Central Community College, it was massive. I mean, it, was, it stretched, you know, the length of the, where the current college is, is from, what, what street would that be? Broadway. Yeah, it was on Broadway, but from, Pike. yeah, all the way, you know, up to what, John, I mean, past John, I mean, it, it was, a, it was filled with people. And it was so many people, um, I mean, that we had to do, um, make a serious effort to control the crowd to, so that it wouldn't get out of hand because People were, people were angry, you know? And Tyree once said, <clears throat> he said, you know, I mean, they're upset uh, because they don't have a job, but they're all so upset every time they see their water bill or their phone bill and they can't, they don't have any money to pay it, you know? So, you know, that was a motivating factor, was, you know, and, and everybody thought, you know, that, you know, that, if this was going to pass, but it didn't pass, and we followed through, um, you know, right on through federal court. Uh, I was appointed as the um, on the on the uh, panel, not panel. What do they call it? The court advisory committee, and um, the uh, what's the name? The the federal judge. Um, yeah. Lindbergh appointed Judge Volin. He was a bankruptcy attorney. He was also head of the uh, University of Washington Law School at the time. And I was on that advisory committee. We met on a regular basis to assess the compliance of the unions, you know, with the court's order. And the court, I mean, the, as you probably already know, and Trevor went to some of it, you know, they had to t take in you know, so many blacks and other minorities in every, in, you know, in the four, in the four trades. And, in, and if they didn't do that, you know, we would have a category called, you know, trainees. And, you know, because our objective was, hey, these, I mean, we're gonna work, period, right? And so you'd have situations where people would be dispatched out to jobs and they wouldn't give anything to do. You just would sit around all day, you know. I mean, you wouldn't be getting trained, et cetera. So that wasn't working, you know. So we progressed on to more uh, focus on integrating into the actual apprenticeship programs, and that was a lot more successful. Um, and it, you know, it lasted, you know, for, for some time. I mean. It resulted, actually, it turned out that we had several um, heads of, uh, I mean, minorities that had, uh, ended up being the business managers for Local 46 and Local 32. I don't know about the uh, sheet metal. I don't know if we, no, we got there. Not at all. Okay, okay, but, you know, we had a, 
we, you know, we had a, a measured success. Um, he, he says, "What were your, what were your membership meetings like?" Well, I mean, it was, it was, it was like your, like, you know, how you have these reality shows today. Yeah, we would have had a hit. Okay, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, because people were free to speak, um, to express themselves, because uh, as part of our whole philosophy was to empower workers, you know, and to, and to teach them that they could, in fact, take control of their own destiny and their own lives, right? And they were just as smart and just as capable as anybody else. And that was, that was the whole, that was the whole, that was the basis for the, for the whole movement, you know, because after you've suffered discrimination for so long, okay, um, you know, it, get in, it gets embedded in you, all right? Uh, I benefited through my work history. Um, tell you a story. I, I went to work, I went to apply for a job at Boeing after my sophomore year in college. And I was just gonna work this summer. And it was five of us, all friends, that went to apply. The other four were dark complected. Okay? Guess who got hired? Okay. And so, I mean, that in itself uh, generates, you know, issues. With our, within our own community, you know? I can't ever remember having a problem getting a job, a part-time job or whatever, you know? I mean, it was, it was the subtleties of racism goes just be, I mean, goes beyond, and the damage goes beyond just not getting a job, you know? It's the reasons why you didn't get a job, all right? Um, kind of veered off the subject, but, you know, that was important to bring up. That pretty much wraps mine up. <laughs> we can cover more with the Q&A, too. Oh, okay. So thank you so much. Let's see. And if you just want to clip on the mic. Does that work? Okay. Um, so I'm Michael Wu. I'm actually a Seattle native, and uh, my father was an immigrant from China. Um, but I grew up basically in the central area, and that's what I knew my world to be. Uh, coincidentally, the house I grew up in uh, was directly across the street from Garfield High School. <laughs> and. Um, I graduated in 67, and it was in those years, 66, 67, 68, um, that we talk about employment and unemployment in the community. Um, when you were a, a, a teenager, you could work. And I remember catching a bus on Yesler and Martin Luther King used to be Empire Way. And we used to catch a bus with other young kids and go to the farms and pick vegetables and fruit and berries and after a long day come home. Um, but we learned how to work that way. And I remember being across the street from Garfield High School. Um, we always were trying to figure out, you know, how do we put money in our pockets? Uh, 67, 68, 60, or 66, 67, 68, uh, we're working in the canneries in Alaska. Um, and when I came home, uh, each, at the end of each canning season, uh, still without a college education, trying to figure out kind of what to do with my life. I think it was 1969 when they had that sign, the last person out of Seattle turn off the lights, right? right? right. Um, Big boy yeah, there was, the economy was really poor. And uh, by that time I was already 
married with a young child on the way and um, found myself uh, and my wife on public assistance, right? We couldn't find work. And ironically, when I went to the unemployment office, as you have to do each week, uh, I was referred to a new organization uh, up on Capitol Hill to go seek out a construction job. Well, that organization was the United Construction Workers Association, uh, which was not an employer, nor were they a union. Uh, the unemployment office didn't know that there were a group of amazing organizers <laughs> and community-minded people up there that would sit down with individuals coming through the door and talk to them about why this issue of equal access to good paying construction jobs, you know, it wasn't just about black workers, it was about other workers. Uh, and it caught my attention, right? And so I think it, by 1970, they had already closed the airports and um, Garfield High School pool. And I just, I was out, of, I was in Alaska that summer when that happened. But I really related to the issue they were talking about because I was certainly able to work at that young age, right? Uh, didn't really see myself having a future at the University of Washington, which I dropped out. Um, so what the United Construction Workers did for me was kind of uh, create a career or a lifetime of passion for equity and justice. And what Harley didn't say about the United Construction Workers and the impact that they had was that in 1969, when the um, um, uh, U.S. Department of Justice got involved, their discovery showed that there were fewer than 10 black skilled workers in five major construction trades. And by 1977, some seven or eight years later, following Judge Lindbergh's court order, there were well over five to six hundred. It was a significant infusion of uh, diversity into these building trades. And we can talk, I'll talk about that a little later in terms of what the importance of that was. But certainly, um, the United Construction Workers was the foundation for the rest of kind of the, the labor history and the organizing that, that took place. I was fortunate enough to be hired by the United Construction Workers in 1971. Um, and I don't know why they hired this young Chinese guy with no construction experience, but I was able to come on staff and learn from both the men and women that were uh, really so passionate about this issue that it was just a huge opportunity to learn and to kind of move forward. There were a group of board members at <coughs> the United Construction Workers who were exclusively um, uh, skilled black men with some construction experience. Uh, they had either, like Tyree, had learned it in the military or, you know, worked with some families or uh, companies in, in the South and came here but were unable to get employed. And that group of uh, UCWA board members um, understood kind of the oppression that they faced, right, and wanted to see how they could move and share based on the successes that they had with their two-pronged approach. Remember, they were using direct action organizing along with uh, the use of the law, right? And they wanted to see, you know, what would happen if there was an industry that they could apply that to. And I was only a few years out of the canneries myself, right? So I was well aware of the plantation, plantation style conditions that existed in these canneries and shared that information along with uh, Cindy's brothers and kind of other uh, cannery workers in the Asian community to the Lilo board. 
And this group of black construction workers voted to give their limited resources to seed an organizing effort that I was fortunate to be one of the organizers to travel to Alaska and to travel to California and, and the greater Seattle area to organize and meet with workers, both <clears throat> in the canneries in Alaska, but once they return home, to help gather the stories and build the relationships that would later um, be the fuel for the lawsuits that they would bring on behalf of themselves, <clears throat> other cannery workers, including Native Alaskans, right, that uh, were experiencing this differential treatment. So I, th I think the significance kind of 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 that was that um, that two-pronged approach it was not I mean having access to the to using the law uh, title 7 anti-discrimination law um, for most individuals was out of reach but to do it through an organization with your peers you know, the other co-workers uh, it felt like this was an effort to get involved in. So there was a lot of excitement around, and, it, and some of it was um, uh, secretive, right? I don't remember what the word is, but it was secretive as we moved through the canneries uh, and as they talked with each other about, you know, we're going to sue or we're going to get organized. And the lawsuits became a basis of hope that we can change both the economic conditions for workers uh, of color in Alaska canneries, but we also can change the kind of living conditions and types of jobs and skills that workers could obtain. And while the lawsuits themselves went on and on, and because they were civil cases, uh, many of them weren't decided until the 1990s, right? Um, the, the leadership of the organizing effort had already solidified. And they both were solidified about, around their opposition to the discrimination in, can, in the canneries, but they were also solidified around some corruption that existed, you know, uh, internally in their union, right? Uh, that, um, uh, was dispatched along with workers to canneries and so there was corruption in many of these places and that became the basis for a strong democratic uh, takeover effort and both um, the Domingo brothers and other cannery workers including uh, Jean Vernis, right, uh, won a successful slate to take over the leadership uh, of Local 37 of the International Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union. Um, that was a significant effort that paralleled these court cases that was ongoing, but they immediately started to control their own destiny, right, by um, both eliminating the corruption, but establishing more democratic kind of processes inside of the union. Uh, but that was threatening. And I, I, I'm sure both um, Cindy and Ricardo may talk more about kind of the tragedy that happened, but part of Seattle's black history or blackened history has been the deaths um, by assassination. Uh, both Selmy and Jean, uh, Selmy Domingo and Jean Vernis here at a local union hall. And uh, I, won't, I won't take other folks' time to talk about that. But the importance of kind of both Selmy and Jean's work uh, transcended both the, their local efforts um, and their efforts in Alaska to improve conditions. Um, but it was recognized 
through their efforts at an ILWU convention uh, that led to kind of a boycott or blockade or what's the word I'm thinking of, of the martial law in the Philippines, right? De denouncing the martial law in the Philippines. But so, I mean, immediately we saw moving from black cannery workers now to Asian and Filipino cannery workers that there became a much broader impact than just what they saw in their own immediate economic conditions and their fight in their workplace. Um, you know, I, I've kind of gone well away from kind of what scripted I thought I was going to talk about, but I think um, the fact that the organization Lilo moved away from being a law office, I think it was 1997, um, many of the legal cases that the law office, the Northwest Labor and Employment Law Office Lilo brought were landmark cases. The, the Judge Lindbergh decision that Lilo was involved in implementing is considered to be a landmark case around um, Title VII class action lit litigation where it was successful, where there was an impact. It impacted the, the, the employment uh, work pool. Uh, but Lilo also worked on numerous cases brought by um, the United Farm Workers, right, of Washington against growers in eastern Washington, right? The, there were five major cannery class action lawsuits, right? One of them, Wards Cove, which is very famous, uh, ended up in the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, and again, I circled back and just kind of listening to Trevor talk about kind of who this organization, United Construction Worker, was, I just reflected on, wow, <laughs> there was a lot of stuff that happened as a result of that. Um, and I just think that the name change in 1997 was um, an awareness or an acknowledgement that um, that one prong of our strategy using the law uh, was both too expensive and costly and timely. Because remember I said these, I, I didn't say, but the cannery cases got filed in 1973. You know, and not until the mid-80s did we start to see any of the cases uh, be finalized. And Ordinary workers cannot sustain a long legal fight like that uh, without an organization like Lilo that was doing it. That would have never happened. But we realized that um, using the law like that wasn't going to continue to be an effective tool, right? In that, it, with those circumstances, so we went through a, a renaming kind of process. And the name that Lilo ended up with, I think, ad, aptly fits what they represented. A legacy of equality, you know, because there was, there's ongoing disparities of, based on race, right, and gender. Uh, leadership, because unless you're developing leadership to take on the work, right, and to replace those of us who move on, you know, you'll, you'll fail. Um, uh, or, and organizing. And so, unless you're act doing active organizing, and I think that's a criticism both of the left as well as, or as organized labor, right? You know, unless there's active organizing to organize the unorganized, right? To get more people involved and to give them voice, um, that you're doomed for failure is kind of our assessment. So I think I just want to close on that shift made all the sense in the world. Um, 
the kinds of organizing that resulted from both the original core of the United Construction Worker Leaders, the Cannery Worker Leadership, Cindy is well much part of that as well, you know, um, the work that Lila was involved in around both worker organizing, coalition building on a local, national, and international scale is significant. And I'll just say that the work is ongoing. So, you know, I'm proud that I helped to kind of work with another group of folks to build an organization called Got Green, which is built on a model that the green economy needs to be a racially inclusive <laughs> economy and that economic opportunities that grow out of the green economy should filter down into all communities. So, I think that there are many, many kind of uh, spin-off organizations as well as independent small groups that are modeled or should look to be uh, incorporating or learn about certainly the history of uh, the United Construction Workers. So, thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay. My name is Ricardo Ortega. I have been working with Lilo since 1999. When I started working with Lilo, the project was called the Worker to Worker Project. After Tyree passed away, we changed the name to Tyree Scott International Worker to Worker Project. The, the idea that is behind to this project also is the no separate piece. We really believe that the struggle from workers in the United States is connected with the struggle of other workers around the world. That is why we are interested to show our support to them, to learn from their experience, but also to share the knowledge and the experience and the tools that we have in order that we can fight together. Um, when I started working with Lilo, I was really surprised. Um, when you are right to this country, you have the idea that almost everybody is, is white and everybody is reactionary, right? And that said, but when I started interacting with Lilo, my perception of this country changed completely. I saw that uh, people of color have support from some progressive uh, people. And also what was very surprising for me is that Lilo has the analysis of race, but also has the class analysis. I study economics in my country, and for me that was very important. Because they, when I was talking with some political activists in the United States, I feel that something was missing and was the class analysis in, in the United States. But just what happened is that I didn't know the right people who have that analysis. And I was so pleased to start working with um, Asians, Blacks, and Latinos. That was a very interesting experience for me. We. We uh, try to develop our campaigns using the community organizing and some demonstrations. And before Lilo used the legal tool, like my compañeros talked before. And that is very crucial because we try to integrate different tools that we have in our society with the experience that everybody brings from their own struggles. Right? It's not the same the struggle from the blacks in the construction that the Latinos from the farming or the Asians in the cannery. But that doesn't mean that they cannot support each other and share their knowledge. In the International Worker to Worker Project, it has been present in Lilo's work for so many years. Uh, like Michael Gu say, in, in the 80s, uh, the Lilo's work was framed by the assassination of two of our, our funding leaders, um, uh, Salmi Domingo and Jim Biernes. And that was because they passed a resolution against to the, 
dictatorship of the Filipinas, Ferdinand Marcos. That is the reason why they were killed. And what happened is that uh, Cindy and other Lilo um, members, and also another members from the community, organized a campaign, 10 years long campaign for justice until they, f uh, they won. Something that is really important in Lilo is the speaking for ourselves to each other. Um, and this gives us the opportunity to go global. Maybe you know that um, the revolution in Mozambique won in 1974. Some years later, uh, Tyree Scott and Todd Hopkins spent two years from 1990 to 1992 developing the irrigation system right there. And also they were present as observers in the first elections in the Mozambique. They bring a uh, different kind of solidarity to the Mozambique Revolution. Uh, they tried to improve the housing in Mozambique that was very precarious before the revolution and also after the revolution. They bring a brick machine in order that they can improve the materials that they were using to have a better housing right there and also a lot of um, tool construction, right? They send a full containers by boat, right? to support the revolution in Mozambique. Um, but at that time, uh, when they were there, the Reagan ideas were impacting people, not only in the United States, but also around the world. Lilo has a deep conversation about how, we, how the rank and file workers <coughs> can confront neoliberalism. And they conclude that the neoliberalism is the main enemy of the, of the, of the workers around the world. In um, early 1999, I didn't start working at that time with Lilo. I think it was 1988, right, when you organized the CIVET conference. And Lilo and by uh, workers from 14 countries, and they were 29 workers. As an immigrant, I know how difficult it is to try to explain your ideas in another language that you don't really dominate very well. For me, it takes a lot of time to think what I want to say. And sometimes I feel ex exhausted uh, after five minutes. But Lilo recognized that one of the limitations in order that the workers can explain their political ideas in the context, in the theoretical context, and also in the political sense, they need to speak in their own language. And the workers that they invite, Everybody was talking in their own language. And Lilo put together an amazing translation team. I think this show the respect that Lilo has for workers from other countries, because it was an amazing work to, to really consolidate. Um, these workers were meeting for, I think, four days in CBEC. And they put together a declaration. I bring five copies of that declaration that I want to read. It's pretty brief. But it's very important because show um, how sharp was the analysis of these workers around how globalization was affecting the, the whole humanity. The first one is the environment. And they say, the environment is a worker's issue. We should debate ways to protect jobs, develop an environment. And these objects are not incompatible. Rights to organize. All workers should have the right to organize and have the organization recognized by their employers. Workers should have the right to set their own working standards of that is, should be common working standards ac ac across all borders from all countries. Immigration, all workers should have the right of freedom movement across the borders and have the right to work in their country uh, that they choose free of discrimination, exploitation, and mar marginalization. Uh, women, and work, women workers, the transition of the global economy and privatization, it is women and children who suffer most for the loss of the public sector and some government protections for the less advantage. Women and men should recognize the education about gender roles begins at home. Women and men be in the process of framing their children in such way that both girls and boys race be equal and participate 
in all the work. And also we need to recognize the contribution of women in every single aspect of our society. Um, that was the conclusion that we have, but to have an idea how hard it was to put this conference together is many of the workers that Lilo and Bai, they couldn't get the visas. And they couldn't get the visas because they have a criminal background in their own country. Not because they killed somebody, not because they stole something, it's because they tried to organize other workers. And that was, that was the perfect excuse for the United States to exclude these workers. But people were so excited and they really recognized the importance of this dialogue that we have in CBEC that they decided to organize other meetings around the world. We were able to accomplish just two more uh, meetings that I want to share with you. By 2002, um, we started organizing the North America meeting. That was taking place in 2000 in Mexico City in the Workers' University or La Universidad Obrera. We invite 65 workers from Canada, the United States, Mexico, Cuba, Dominican Republic, and Trinidad and Tobago. And they decide to keep in touch, sharing their experience about how they were fighting against neoliberalism. And we create the trabajador a trabajador or the worker to worker newsletter. This newsletter was very, very singular, it was not bilingual, but was by trilingual. Uh, was produced in English, in Portuguese, and in Spanish. In the, in the United States, we print 3,000 copies. In Mexico, we start printing 5,000 5, copies, but the uh, Independence Teachers Union in Mexico was so excited that they print 20,000 more. Every time that we have one issue, they were in charge to print it. That particular newspaper was printed only in, in Spanish. And also we sent um, 2,000 newspapers to Mozambique in Portuguese and English in order that they can be part of this experience. The second meeting that we, I'm sorry that I go so fast, but. We all have, uh, but, don't worry about Okay, it. but um, in Brazil in 2001, we organized the second meeting in Lobeira. 55 workers from Brazil, Ecuador, Mexico, the United States, and Chile, they were participating in this struggle to try to share also their experience. And they decide that um, one way to keep in touch is to use the new technology, but at that time the internet, right? And Lilo provide uh, sufficient funds to have th three, um, three of these centers, that was the information centers. One was in uh, Mozambique, the other one was in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, and the third one was in Mexico City. And the idea was to share everything that we know about workers' struggle in our own countries. Uh, something that, that I want to, to say is that um, before this happened, we participate in the demonstration against to the WTO. We created the Workers' Voices Coalition. That was an amazing organization. It was created mainly by Lilo. That was the force that was behind. And we invite the community to participate in order that we can share our concerns against uh, what is going on in our communities, in our countries, and in the global economy in general. We invite nine workers from six different uh, countries to participate in these demonstrations. They were mainly ranking for workers. Um, and we contact their organizations, and they have their own meetings, and they decide who is going to participate in those meetings here in, in Seattle. And I would like to read the names in order that you can have an idea who they were and what kind of work they were doing at that time. Chi Abad, former garment worker and organizing in some Saipan against to the uh, swatch-ups. Altagracia de Jesus, leader of the coordinations of women from Cibao. Senem Begon from Vancouver Committee for Domestic Work and Caregivers' Rights. Ana Simiao, leader of Domestic Workers Union in Brazil. Amparo Reyes, assembly worker 
an organizer in Piedras Negras, Mexico. That is the border of, with the United States. Ana Guzman, United Farm Workers from Western Washington, Eastern Washington. Glennon Pufani, National Union Mine Workers from Johannesburg, South Africa. Martin Rodriguez, teacher of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And Francisco Cuevas, mining organizer workers from Guerrero, Mexico. Uh, we continue organizing other meetings, but also one of our ideas is to send mainly ranking farm workers, people of color, to other countries in order that they can see by themselves how people are living in other countries, how they are fighting, and how well and how sharp is their analysis. Uh, because we invite people from uh, Ecuador to participate in our meeting in Brazil in 2000, the CONAI, that is the national organization, maybe one of the most powerful national organization created by the indigenous people, invite Lilo to participate in the first national assembly and was the only organization from the United States that was invited. And I remember that when the participate from the United States meet with um, Tyreen, he said something like that is, I am so pleased that I meet my friends from the United States who are fighting back. You are inspiration, right? And Tyree replied, you are inspiration for me too. Um, the second time that we were invited was from the Map Mapuche Nation from Chile to participate also in the first national meeting. And also Lilo was the only organization that attended from the United States to participate in that event. Um, we organized a delegation to Venezuela in 2009 to see what is the beauty of the Bolivarian Revolution. We sent, I think, um, nine people to, to participate in this delegation, and the delegation was 10 days long. Also, uh, Gary and Nemesio Domingo participate in the Human Rights Conference in South Africa in 2001, and also in 2006, they participate in the Environment um, World Conference. Lilo has the pleasure to participate in the People's Permanent Tribunal, Chapter Mexico, organizing a pre-hearing about immigration in 2015. We collect um, massive, massive human rights violations uh, from different workers who are living here in the United States, and we have 12 declarations or 12 accusations against to the, uh, the United States government, the Mexican government, and the Canada government. What was very interesting is that when the people who was the, the judges, because we have like um, some judges who were hearing what were the human rights violations, they decided that the corporations and the government are equal responsible for those human rights violations. And um, in the last two years, uh, part of our international work is that we organize the delegation that visit uh, the Northwest from the parents of the students that disappeared in um, Mexico in, two, in February of 2015 from Ayotzinapa. 45 students were kidnapped by the police and they disappeared. Nobody knows if they are still alive or not. But we organize their uh, participation in Washington and also in Oregon. And last year we bring a caravan that visit um, 20, 22 states in the United States. And this caravan was talking about the horrible human rights situation in Mexico. And we coordinate the caravan in Washington state. Also we coordinate um, in Oregon and the north of California. And part of the recognition of the contributions of the workers to the United States, I remember that we have a meeting in 1999 talking about how to celebrate the workers' um, day uh, in around the world who celebrate the workers' day or, or the May Day is May Day you know, in September, right? And what we decide is to start organizing the March, the May of the day. We were the first in this country to start organizing every single year those demonstrations since 1999. And that was thanks to Lilo's support. Thank you. Thank you.
hear that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Higher. Better? Okay. So my name is Gary Owens. I've been with Lilo for, uh, for informally for about four years and formally for about 25 years. Uh, as a member of the board, um, I've had an opportunity to um, help uh, do the work in many different contexts. Um, some of it in involves traveling. Um, Ricardo mentioned some of it, and I think so did Ricardo. It, it was interesting that uh, when we would travel to international sites, or even national sites, people, even though we were a small organization, people had already heard of our organization, and that's sometimes how we got invited to other, other events or other struggles. I want to speak a little bit about um, a very important case that involves uh, the history of Lilo and also a very important struggle that we are continue today that uh, really shows uh, our true roots and our obligation to our constituency. Um, Michael mentioned it. Um, in the beginning, or a long time ago, uh, we found out through uh, the, the research that people had done on the, on the ground that in Alaska, uh, carry workers were being heavily discriminated against. Uh, they were mostly um, uh, Filipino, Chinese, Japanese, Samoan, and Native American descent. And they, the issue was that they were um, offered something that was not reputable, and that meant that they had uh, separate um, quarters to sleep in that were not very dignified, holes in the walls and leaked and beds that leaned and so on and so forth, a different um, menu to eat and, pr and pretty much no opportunity to be uh, elevated in terms of their work status. So no, no foremanships, no nothing. Um, that had been going on for a long time. And there were thousands of, this impacted thousands of uh, workers because this was a multi-million dollar enterprise of gathering the fish in Alaska, off the coast of Alaska. So <clears throat> there was a notion that as a law office, the Northwest Labor and Employment Law Office, there was an obligation to do something. So in um, March 20th, 1974, three dozen cannery workers um, filed a class action lawsuit against the Ward's Cove Packing Company and the New, New England Fish Company and another one called Nefco Fidalgo. They charged as non-white workers, they were victims of rampant racial discrimination. And it, in this, case, this particular case, Ward's Cove became an infamous story about how the U.S. legal system would fail to protect workers' human rights. These 2,000 cannery workers were denied fair treatment and equality. So this case uh, stayed in on the books for 27 years. Um, the irony of the case is, is that um, Lilo was a unique organization in the sense that it was the first law office developed by uh, in a nonprofit structure led by people of color in the United States. So it made it unique in terms of its focus. Um, the idea was is that even though there had been laws on the books in the United States through the uh, civil rights laws that had been passed and whatnot, they weren't being implemented to, to protect the rights of these workers. Um, and so there was a bear down. The bear down was on March 20th, 1974, when these workers filed a lawsuit, um, actually it was three lawsuits, the companion lawsuits against uh, Ward's Cove, uh, a New England Fish Company, and uh, Nefco Fidalgo, that, that was an important gesture. It was an important gesture because it meant that um, the dominoes could fall. The dominance could fall. The prevailing issues could go in a different direction, and this was very important. And so 
the, one of the things that we learned in doing, uh, listening to people like Michael and Nemicio and other folks that we knew who were, who were in the canneries, we had an obligation as an organization to figure out what would, what our, what would our strategy be. And one of the things that came up was not, not only would we decide to be in the lawsuit process, we had our own lawyer. This particular case, by the way, went all the way to the Supreme Court and it, it was reversed. One of the things that got said um, about the case, which is very ironic, was by one of the Supreme Court um, judges, J Judge Blackman, in his dissent. He said, the quote, the salmon industry as described in the Wars Cove case takes us back to a kind of overt and institutionalized discrimination we have not dealt with in years. A total residential and work environment organized on principles of racial stratification and segregation. This industry long has been characterized by a taste for discrimination of the old fashioned sort, a preference for hiring non-whites to fill its lowest level positions on the condition that they stayed there, end quote. Very powerful statement by, by a judge, I mean, as you well know, uh, these people are appointed for life, so he had nothing to lose, but that's not true. He, what he had to lose was his integrity, to follow the law and to live in a country that had a lot of hyperbole about how fair it was and how just it was, but you had all these contradictions. So one of the things that came up as the law, uh, law um, as the case got referred back and forth, going from one court to the next, being remanded or whatever. One of the things that kept coming up was uh, different things that uh, some of the panels had to deal with. One of them was um, called the Griggs Standard. Um, Griggs um, was a African-American janitor and he sued in North Carolina, Duke Power Company, for practices which kept him and other workers of color from advancing beyond menial jobs. So it became the Griggs versus Duke Power Company, the courts ruled. But, they, but the courts ruled that, pra, quote, practices that are fair in form, but discriminatory, discriminatory in practice, or have a disparate impact, are discriminatory and therefore illegal. That empowered the Ward's Cove, work, Ward's Cove workers to appeal to the ninth uh, judge panel of the Ninth Circuit Court. and. In 1987, that court strongly rebuked the, the judge, of course, of the case then, and Judge Quackenbush, Quackenbush and the three-judge uh, panel for their poor decisions and rule in favor of the workers. So that was, people had hope that somehow the, 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 the rule of law would somehow be in their favor. But there was what now, I use a word that my young sons use, there was some trickeration. It's not a word I made up, it's, that's young people's talk. But, and the trickeration was in the details. And the idea was if we could find the right political um, uh, mechanism to make sure that this case would go away, that this wouldn't be the a paradigm of, of uh, of the day, it would be a paradigm that we could forget about and, and let the status quo prevail. And the idea was, is that when it went to the Supreme Court, the, the, the court was deeply divided and they voted um, five to four favoring the, actually the employer in Ward's Cove versus Antonio. They, they overturned the Griggs, um, um, element of it, eliminating a tool for workers to fight discrimination and unfair treatment. In, the, his dissenting, in his dissenting opinion, another judge, Justice Stevens, wrote that the Wards Cove cannery, quote, bears an unsettling resemblance to aspects of plantation economy. That was his statement. Another powerful statement from another judge who wasn't afraid to tell the truth. So folks prevailed. And actually, when it was remanded back to the original court, that's where it died, um, maybe 10 years ago or so. Um, 
But the notion was this, what came out of it was something we were powerful. For us, it came out with the, the ideas of Wars Cove was a speak out, take action mo moment that we needed to do something. Uh, we started the Wards Cove project for civil rights and, and, and worker justice. And we had a um, congressman, Judge, uh, Jim, Jim McDermott, who was one of the, he, support, he supported a bill called the Justice for Wards Cove Act in 1991. And it didn't go anywhere, it couldn't, it couldn't get a vote. So he resubmitted it uh, as a new bill with the same language on March 28, 2012. And its focus was to remain, remove the amended language that excluded Wards Cove workers. The contradiction was the, the 1991 civil rights law was being passed. And so the way they got it passed, even though they had, um, Bill Clinton had sent these workers and this organization um, a, a letter saying he strongly favors uh, a, a law that exonerates uh, the workers' exclusion from a fair, pre fair play. Well, they got around it because they bought off two, uh, one, but two uh, senators, Murkowski from Alaska, and they made promises, uh, you know, he made promises, they made promises, and so the, 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 uh, the, the Ward's Cove part was kind of expunged from the bill so that that meant that those workers wouldn't have any more legal stay, they would be done. So that's the way that people use the law. Uh, part of the issue um, that we saw that came out of that ended up being um, when we traveled, when Amishi and I traveled both to uh, South Africa at the racism conference, there was great interest in this case by a lot of different people. Uh, what did people do? Uh, what, what was some of the notion about uh, the impact that had on the workers here? Of course, we told the truth. The workers were very discouraged. But it wasn't new. It wasn't the first time that the law had been used to deny uh, workers' rights. And so um, we know that today um, there's still a call, a hue and cry for our communities to make sure that the law is uh, in our favor. The transition for us is that uh, with this good brother's help, back in the day when he was still with us, he created, uh, there was a notion here, there's a, there's a project here called Sound Transit. And it was gonna be a, tr a, tr a, a huge transit uh, 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 opportunity for, to get people moving on the, on the roads and, uh, that didn't have to drive, um, that was gonna connect three uh, counties where, it was, where uh, most of the population of the city, of, of the state lived. And so uh, Michael started a project called four act, uh, uh, called, um, I'm forgetting my thing here. Fairness and Fairness and access to <laughs> for sound transit. And the idea was is that we wanted to be at the table. And so they were fortunate enough to get, get uh, signed up, if you want to call it that way, uh, in a, a project labor agreement that would keep us in the project in perpetuity until it was finished. It's a long-term project, we're still there. So, but the idea is, is that um, all the things that we want, uh, what we call a partial victory, have to be implemented. So you know, construction work hours, uh, uh, apprenticeships, permanent members of the Joint Administrative Committee, uh, money set aside for training and support services, uh, uh, no uh, unjust turnarounds or whatever. All those need to be happening concurrently. And so we know that from, from all the things that have happened in the last uh, 10 years or so have been, or more, 15 years, have um, been in some senses almost like Awards Cove in the sense that some of our workers are, some of our workers are working, but not enough. And the part of the, the insult probably is when uh, workers are um, invited by their unions to come and work here from other states when we have a labor pool here that sits dormant. Um, so we've, we've been working hard uh, over the pa past uh, 10 years or so to make sure that we, that Sound Transit knows where we're coming from. Because we know in Seattle there's a history here. This, the history is, is that some of our mostly dads 
who were construction workers didn't ca get a chance to work on the major public works projects in this area, whether it was the building a new highway, whether it was the building any of the bridges that across our lake here, whether it was the, you name it, any public works project that was huge, most of us didn't get the opportunity, our dads or our moms didn't get an opportunity to work on those projects. Some of that still prevails. So people feel all these different ways to deflect the potential of our labor and that creates a lot of uh, angst in terms of not just the legitimacy of the labor movement itself, but the idea that somehow public sector dollars could be used to deny our human rights as workers to be assigned the opportunity to work in these, in these, on these projects. Very, very important. So we know that fast jobs to us, even though it may be minimized to a certain degree, has a certain concreteness that we'll never give up because of, of, of the principles it was ba based on and because it's an agreement that the entity made with us. So the idea is we keep trying to hold them accountable Gary, to make sure. I think that might be a good place to, to wrap up. Okay.